So next speaker is uh, Sandor Tachila from uh, University of uh, Cambridge. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, it's great to be back in Santa Cruz. Um, so the work I'll present has been done in close collaboration with the Chase team, and in particular with Brent Robertson and Ben Johnson, who are both here in the room. So building off um, of uh, Brent's talk on Chase, um, I will be discussing um, the high stretch of galaxies zooming in on their spatial resolved properties. I will discuss um, the morphology of them, but also then move on to the enrichment um, of, of early galaxies. And at the end, if I have time, I'll discuss a bit more on star formation regulation and quenching. So first, um, let's take a step back and try to understand um, how star formation might proceed in a um, lambda CDM universe. Um, we have been building these very simple toy models where we just assume that the star formation in a galaxy is proportional to the dark matter accretion rate times the baryon fraction. And typically, what we do is we assume that the star formation efficiency is um, redshift independent and only depends on halo mass. And if one then calibrates such a model, one gets this characteristic curve for the star formation efficiency that peaks around you know, a halo mass of about 10 to 11 solar masses. Now, these models are actually um, surprising um, successful in describing, for example, the UV luminosity function, but also the cosmic star formation rate density. So this is uh, pre-JWST data, and you can see that one gets this overall increase over you know, five orders of magnitude um, from redshift you know, 14 up to redshift 4. And the main reason for this very strong increase in these models is really the, you know, the assembly of, of the dark matter halos with cosmic time. And so what you can see here on the right is, again, the star formation efficiency. But what I'm adding there now is the halo mass function. And you can see how you know, the halo mass function moves into this regime where now you have a high number density of objects that are able to host you know, um, star formation in an efficient way. And so this dark increase at early times is really different by an increased number density, but also you know, having more halos in the star formation efficient regime and higher um, accretion rates. Now, I think one can, of course, play around with this. You can, for example, change the star formation efficiency of redshift, and so then you get you know, kind of similar trends at lower redshifts, but there is this interesting divergence of the models you know, from redshift 10 onwards. And so the question is really, what, what can we learn there, in particular with, with JWST? And we have already heard from Garth this morning that there has been really a lot of very interesting papers in the very first year um, on trying to constrain the number densities of these high redshift galaxies. And here I'm talking of galaxies above a redshift of eight. And um, I think, you know, overall, the, there seems to be a high number density of these uh, very bright high redshift galaxies. And the question is, maybe there are too many of them. But I also want to caution that most of these um, data sets have been based on uh, photometric redshifts. And as, as Richard Bounds has shown, that, you know, the, the, even though people use similar data sets, the candidate lists actually diverge quite significantly. So let's zoom on, on to the physics of maybe a single galaxy first, and in particular GNC11. As I've already been, uh, mentioned this morning uh, by Garth as well. And I think it's really, you know, that this guy has been around with us since 2010. At that time, it was discovered in Enigmos data. And it was so unusually bright and only detected at age band that Richard Bounds at that time said, well, you know, it could be a high redshift galaxy candidate, but they considered highly unlikely. However, then with Pascal Zosch's work, um, it has been put down um, back onto the candidate list, in particular with, you know, Spitzer IROC um, detections and the K band detection. And then, of course, with the Grissom redshift, um, that puts it around the redshift of 11. And again, the unusual thing of GNC11 is really, you can see it in the bottom right there, where you can see that you know, this galaxy is at very high redshifts and really, really bright. Right? You're seeing that you know, the, bright, the luminosity of this galaxy is about three times L star at redshift 7. So it's really, really an outlier. And so the question is, why is GNC11 so bright? Is it an HGN? Is the distance wrong? Or what's going on? And so as part of Chates, we have been um, you know, observing this galaxy in the Goods North field. And we have really come, you know, put together a wide range of, of, of papers um, focusing on this galaxy. And I don't have time to go into all the details, but I'm happy to discuss them um, you know, later on as well um, during this week. Um, what I show you here is the near cam image um, of Goods North um, on a zoom in. And you can see GNC11 there. And the yellow arrows show you basically galaxies that are um, at a similar redshift. Now, these are just photometric redshifts. Um, in, a, in a sphere of about of, um, five megaparsec. So you can see that you know, this galaxy seems not to be alone, and there are many other galaxy candidates around this object. I think the most astonishing data that came out um, you know, from this galaxy is really the spectrum. It's a seven-hour exposure here shown from the prism um, with near spec. And you can just see the Lyman alpha drop, but also a suite of, of emission lines, which of course allows us um, not just to determine the redshift now correctly, which is you know, 10.6, uh, but also learn more about the physical property of this system. 
On the photometric side, um, you can clearly see it's a, it's a dropout galaxy, and then you can see that the galaxy is, is detected you know, up to a 4 micron, and you can also see that it's rather compact. And so we have been spending a lot of time to understand actually the point spread function so that we can really do a careful understanding of the structure of this galaxy. The first thing that you notice is a haze-like structure on the top left that has already been kind of indicative in the, in the NICMOS data, actually. And then you can see um, the galaxy seems to be very compact. Um, but what we can see is that the galaxy is actually extended. It's larger than the point spread function. But in order to learn more about the structure itself, you really need to do the forward modeling of the light. And here, Ben Johnson has been developing this tool called Forceful, which allows us to basically forward model all the individual exposures, all the individual filters at the same time so that we can get really most of the signal to noise and also don't have to worry when we work on mosaics, for example, with correlated noise. And you know, generally, when you work with mosaics, you always destroy information as well. So we really want to forward model each individual exposure so that we can get most um, out when it comes to signal to noise, but also the, you know, the spatially resolved um, characteristics of the galaxy. So um, what do we see? Well, we forward model the scene um, around GNC11 and GNC11 itself. And what I show you here is the fraction of the fluxes in the extended component. So what we're doing is we model, it, we model GNC11 as a point source plus an extended component plus the haze. And you can see that you know, for the extended component, we see that about 30% of GNC11 is in this extended component and the other 70% is in this point, uh, point source in the middle, and the extended component has a size of about 0.05 um, arc seconds. So now what we can do is now, because we have you know, decomposed the light into this central region, into the point spread function, the extended component, we can actually infer the cell population properties of the, both components independently. So I show you here, basically, an SED model um, you know, obtained from Prospector. On the, on the top, it's the point source, and the bottom, you can see the SED of the extended component. And you see that they are slightly different, right? So the point source um, seems to be consistent with a rising star formation history, a rather young component, and um, a stellar mass of about you know, 10 to the 8.4. On the other hand, the extended component um, is slightly older, um, has a constant or slightly decreasing star formation history, and a stellar mass about you know, 10 to the 8.9. And so then it shows you that basically the luminosity is really dominated by the point source, right? About a factor of three more light is coming out from the point source but the stellar mass itself is dominated by this extended component underneath. And so what, what is shown here, well, why is GNC11 so bright? Well, you can actually reproduce the observed SED um, very well with simple you know, stars and some, um, some you know, dust absorption and, and nebular emission. So you don't need to invoke any peculiar stellar populations or anything. Um, the, the reason for being so bright is just that it has this nuclear starburst that is really, really bright, right? Low in mass, but you know, high in star formation. Um, however, when we look at the spectrum in more detail, we can, clear, you know, we can, can find clear indications for actually HN activity in the core of this galaxy. And so here I'm just mentioning a few of them. One is, for example, the, the p signi feature that we can see in the C4 line that imply outflow velocities of 800 to about 1,000 kilometers per second. But also the semi-forbidden line you know, indicate that you are looking at gas densities of about 10 to the 10 uh, you know, per centimeter cubed. So again, this shows that we are probably looking at a, a broadline region of an HEN in this galaxy. And it's interesting if you now take you know, the, the magnesium doublet or also the N4 line and convert this into a black hole mass, you are inferring a black hole mass of the order of 10 to the 6 solar masses. And again, this connects actually quite nicely to the black holes that we observe at later epochs, around redshift 6 or 7, the quasars. You can grow this black hole basically with Eddington-like accretion, and you see that you're you know, gaining to redshift 6 you know, well towards 10 to the 9 solar masses. So again, this galaxy, and in particular this black hole, might be a ni nice stepping stone between understanding the seed formation of black holes and um, the quasars we observe at later times. Now, this is not the only HN that we actually have. Um, so we have been looking into finding these broadline regions, you know, as seen in the in, in Balmer emission lines and throughout jades. Um, and what we are finding is about 12 HN candidates from actually 4 to 7. And again, the black hole mass that we infer are of the order of 10 to the 5 up to 10 to the 8. And typically, they lie above the, the black hole mass stellar mass relation um, observed in the local universe. So it seems that these galaxies have rather massive black holes given their stellar mass. But when you look at other scaling relations, they are, seem to be more you know, spot on. Now, these black holes are actually difficult to find. Um, when you look at BPT like diagrams, they are not like, you know, clearly you know, in the upper right regime, right? They are mimicking um, like star forming galaxies. 
And um, the other thing is that if you have a red point source, it's also not always an HEM. You know? We also have a lot of brown dwarfs in the sample, and they can look, the SEDs of those um, look peculiar, but you know, HENs could look very similar. So there is a, a large confusion between uh, HENs and, uh, and, uh, and brown dwarfs if you have just photometry. And so what you really want to do is you want to get deep spectra and or look also at proper motions because we can actually use the deep HSD images and see how you know, these point sources that are red move around in the images going from HSD to JWST. Okay, so let's move back to, to high redshift galaxies. We have seen um, this diagram, I think, um, early this morning already. So this shows you the, basically you know, the magnitude as a function of redshift, and this is pre-JWST. Um, you know, and so here is now, you know, over 700 galaxy candidates above redshift 8 coming in from JATES. And you can see that, you know, we get more and more spectroscopic redshifts, but it's really, really hard work. You know, um, we, the, the multi-shutter array, the configurations and so on, like you can only get a few. Um, it's, so it's, it's, it, it'll take a few years to really get redshifts for everything that is on this, this diagram. What I'm very interested in is actually not just seeing these dots, but actually resolving these galaxies. So these are the galaxies that we have now um, at redshift 8 and above. And some of them are spectroscopically confirmed, such as you know, the two on the top there. And you can just see that you know, these guys are not just point sources. Um, they are extended. They have, it seems, color gradients. Now, this is, again, you have to think about correcting it for the point spread function. But it's clear that there are color gradients in these galaxies. And I, myself, am very interested in understanding those. So um, Brent has been presenting our work on um, some of these high red, highest redshift galaxies have been spectroscopically confirmed. The, the, red, you know, the, 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 the redshifts allow you to infer the cell population properties of those galaxies. And we are finding star formation rates that are similar to the Milky Way of one to two solar masses per year. But as Brent has mentioned, he said these galaxies are so compact that you know, their star formation rate surface densities are now tens up to 100 solar masses per year per kiloparsec squared. So really forming a lot of stellar mass in a very compact configuration. And, and so here I want to now connect this more to the slightly lower redshift regime, right? Redshift 7.43, which is an interesting galaxy because um, we have been seeing this galaxy. First of all, has a spectroscopic redshift. Stellar mass about 10 to the 8, star formation of 10 solar masses per year. So it's kind of a typical star forming galaxy, I would say, at you know, redshift, um, redshift 8, about 700 million years after the Big Bang. But what we saw is that they have very strong um, color gradients. And even after you know, homogenizing for the PSF, you can see that the colors um, in different bands, um, you know, as a function of radius, look very different. And this is mostly because you have um, a, um, a 4, 410M excess, which traces the oxygen 3 line and the H-beta line, that, that varies in strength as a function of radius. And so what we have been doing, again, is we have been trying to uh, forward model the light distribution in all the past band to understand what are the cell population gradients in this galaxy. And so again, we have been decomposing the galaxy into a disk component, a core-like component, and a clump that you can see on the top right. And so we are finding for the core um, a size of about 144 parsecs and a source thickness of about 2.5, whereas for the disk, we have fixed the source thickness index to 1, and you can see that the size is significantly larger. And so now we can again use uh, forceful to basically get the SED for these different components, and then we use prospector to infer the cellular populations. And when just looking at the star formation history, you can see that the core is slightly older, and the star formation history of the disk is more rising towards recent times. And so we can use this then to actually convert this to stellar mass, star formation rate, and specific star formation rate profiles as a function of radius. You can see that the stellar mass surface density is really dominated by the core in the inner region and then by the disk in the outer region. The star formation surface density profile is dominated by the disk throughout. And then when we look at the specific star formation profile, and you have to look at this dashed line which shows you the combined profile, you can see that um, it is rising as a function of radius. Now the horizontal line shows you the half mass radius of this galaxy, which is 260 parsecs. You can see that the specific star formation rate is lower in the central region and higher in the outskirts. So it seems that this galaxy is actually increasing its half mass radius. And um, it does so rather rapidly because you can see that the specific star formation rate profile has values in the outskirts that are you know, implying mass doubling time scales of a few tens of millions of years. So if we take this galaxy and we put it on the half mass size um, you know, stellar mass plane, you can see that this galaxy is, is, of course, very compact, right? It's about 260 parsecs. But if you keep evolving, you know, the stellar mass surface density profile, as, as shown here, 
And we're just adding the star formation rate as observed to this galaxy as a function of time and see where this galaxy actually ends up. You can see that, you know, it starts, you know, it's still increasing its size, but then it flattens, and you see that it actually approaches the size mass relation of quiescent galaxies at redshift 2 quite naturally. So you don't need to do anything peculiar to this galaxy. Now, when we compare or look at the solar mass surface density profile and put it into kind of, you know, a, a crazy context of local ellipticals, so this is the stellar mass surface density function of radius, you can see that actually in the central region of this galaxy, we have stellar mass densities that are approaching 10 to the 10 solar masses per kiloparsec squared. So this is consistent or you know, slightly lower, but within a factor of two or three of local ellipticals. And it's kind of funny to think that this galaxy is a thousand times lower in mass, but the solar mass density in the core is already very you know, consistent with local ellipticals. Um, but of course, you're missing you know, a thousand you know, times more mass, and this is mostly happening in the outskirts. And so the idea is that basically this galaxy, we're observing it currently in an inside-out growth phase, in this early universe, it might, you know, quench at a redshift of two or so. It's in rather compact, and it still needs to build up its envelope. So there's this two-phase inside-out growth that we are basically seeing when we compare this to galaxies across cosmic time. So in the last, let's see how much time I have. Well, let's keep going. So um, the enrichment of, okay. So we have the enrichment of early galaxies. And uh, again, the ERO data here was really, really nice um, because it allowed us um, to actually detect the uh, aurora line, um, oxygen 3, 43, 63, and to the first direct metallicity measurements out to redshift of 8. And when we look at the fundamental metallicity relation, right, that corrects for stellar mass and star formation to then um, see, you know, how different is the metallicity in the galaxy population, you can see that galaxies at low redshift follow the FMR relation quite well, but then at high redshift we seem to have a large diversity of galaxies. It's only three points, you might say, and then we can add a recent Jade's paper from Mirko Curtis' work, and you can just see that there is a lot of scatter. Like, what drives this scatter? You know, are galaxies getting out of equilibrium? What's going on? And so we have been focusing on these three galaxies with the ERO, ERO data, doing um, a careful uh, modeling of both the photometry and the emission lines that we see in the near-spec spectrum, and um, inferring, basically, the star formation histories and the metallicity content and so on. And the first thing is, like, you know, even though we masked the uh, oxygen 3 line, the, dire the direct metallicity indicator, we are able to recover gas phase metallicities that are quite consistent um, with the direct method. So this is a good cross-check. And then I think it's important to highlight and stress that we need the nebular, um, you know, the nebular constraints because this allows us not just to get a constraint on the gas phase metallicity, but also on the dust, the dust attenuation and therefore on the star formation history in those galaxies. How much more? Two minutes? So, um, looking at the star formation histories of these galaxies, well, all of them are increasing. They're all going through a burst phase, and that's not too surprising, right? Because these galaxies probably were selected to be rather bright. Um, but what you also see is the uncertainties on the ages are actually significant. All of them are of the order of about 5 million years, but you see the upper error bars just go to 100 million years or 28 million years, you know, there are large errors. And this is just highlighting and the strength of the Bayesian way to do this, but it highlights the problem that when these guys is going through a starburst, it's really, really difficult to infer anything what happened previously. And so the error bars on, on you know, the amount of stellar mass that formed before are just significant. So now you might say, okay, they're all going through a burst, and they're all similar in mass, um, but why are they so different in metallicity and diverging on the fundamental metallicity relation? And I think there the interesting connection to morphology happens again, right, where we can now see that the galaxies that have, you know, higher metallicities are both having a slightly lower specific star formation at surface densities. They seem to be more clumpy, more extended, whereas this other galaxy that has a really low metallicity seems to be much more compact. And so you're thinking that, you know, the starburst is induced in this lower metallicity galaxy based on fresh gas accretion that leads to low metallicity but also a starburst, Whereas in the other phase, uh, the other two galaxies, they might go through a merger phase where the star formation is induced and metallicity is not that much lower. So are all galaxies going through a burst? And we had you know, a great talk um, uh, just before uh, from Viola about um, quiescent galaxies that have also been detected. Now these galaxies, I think, are quite different from massive galaxy quenching and really focusing kind of at the low mass end of 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 solar masses. Um, but these galaxies seem to be you know, actually also there in the universe. And so this is, again, expected if you have these bursts of star formation and the suppression of, of star formation. 
And so we have been looking with a student, with Tibor Dome um, in Cambridge, into different models and seeing whether these galaxies are there. And indeed, these galaxies are actually present in a wide range of different models, and I don't think I have time to get into too much detail. There is a wide range of processes that actually can lead to such a suppression of star formation from stellar feedback, like uh, secretion onto galaxies and also galaxy-galaxy interactions. And again, of course, they also play um, all together. What I want to stress here is that this phase is really temporary. It doesn't take, you know, it, they are not there for giga years. They're only there for a few tens of million years in all the models. And the fraction of those systems is rather low. And we're talking here of, you know, a few percent of the galaxy population. So last slide, um, because I need to wrap up. Um, so why our bursty star formation is interesting? Well, of course, it's, it's, it, as I said, it's difficult. It, it makes us difficult to infer the stellar masses. But it's also important to consider bursty star formation because it can upscatter galaxies and boost the number densities of some of the bright high of galaxy observations. So when we look at the, at the simple toy model again, where I started out with, we have a very steep halo mass function. And so if you do something um, like going through a burst at the low mass end, you know, even though rarely, but it happens, you can upscatter very easily. And so we have been looking at this with Jacob Shen in a, in a nice paper to understand basically how much scatter do you need in the conversion going from the halo mass accretion rates to the UV luminosity in order to accommodate some of these high number density counts of the highest redshift galaxies. And the scatter that we obtain is not crazy, actually. So what it shows is basically you don't need to change necessarily the star formation efficiency. You can just boost star formation variability to accommodate the higher number densities of galaxies that we observe. And so I'm at the end of my talk. What I want to highlight is that there's fruitful, but also I think necessary, uh, to combine both imaging with spectroscopy. Thank you very much. Very nice talk. Questions? Hi, Sandra. I believe it's very inspiring. Um, concerning the AGN, uh, now, we are convinced, or we think we are convinced that, for example, there could be many AGNs, in particular with the clear example of GNZ11, based on the width of the, of the Balmer lines. Or, on the other hand, the BPT diagram uh, fails miserably. So we have one piece of evidence against another one. So why, which one should we trust? Do you want to comment on that? OK. Thanks. Um, yes, yeah, so at low metallicity, the, the theoretical models for AGN actually lie right across in the star-forming region. So this is totally expected, like predicted uh, by the models. And so you can't use it to classify AGN at those high redshifts because it will be on top of the star-forming region. Um, but Or there could be star-forming galaxies, but probably there's a combination, right? It's unlikely you're just going to get an AGN without star formation around it in the galaxy anyway. Um, so, so uh, yeah, but, but we actually need to look at different diagnostics. So I think um, you had a neon three line. I think, you know, we need to actually start looking at those type of lines because they're a little bit more discriminatory than the BPT diagram is at those yes. redshifts. Yes, so I, I agree very much with that. And I think that, you know, we actually would expect HN activity in most of the galaxies, right? It's just, you know, the contrast of star formation to HN that is also difficult. So the, these guys are very, very star forming. And so therefore, you know, these lines are many times dominated by, you know, by a star formation component. And that's why we need this very deep spectra to see this broader component underneath and only in the Balmer lines and not in the oxygen three lines. Yeah. Okay. We can have one quick question before we head into lunch. Uh, I was very struck by your point that the densities that you're seeing the, the stellar mass surface densities are so high that they can only grow by a small factor like two to reach the densities we see in the center of massive ellipticals today. So that implies that there has to be quenching in the center already at these high redshifts. Uh, presumably, uh, we'll, we'll start to see evidence that the, st the star formation is actually being quenched. and. Uh, what is this caused by? Is it caused by uh, the AGN activity, do you think? Well, I, th I think, you know, it depends what we mean with quenching, right? I think the specific star formation rate in the center is, 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 is smaller than in the outskirts. Um, but it doesn't mean that you need to necessarily have a process that reduces the star formation activity there. It could just be that you don't feed the center as efficiently and you're, you know, you're forming more stars more in the outskirts. No, but your point was 
if I understood it, that you really can't grow the mass, the central mass density, surface density, by more than a small factor. Uh, you might get a little bit of extra growth uh, and then move it back Sounds down again. due to scouring yes. by massive black holes, uh, pairs of black holes merging. But that's only a small factor. So the key point is that you really don't have room to have a lot more star formation in the center, even at these very high redshifts. Yes, so I'm, I'm not sure how much actually, you know, like how much relaxation you could have in the center. I think that could actually be an important contribution to lower the stellar mass surface densities again. Um, but, but indeed, yeah, that's what we observe. I mean, like we see these galaxies being very compact at early times, and they seem to also have formed their black holes already very efficiently. So I think there is a lot of stuff going on you know, in a very compact configuration. Of course, then of how to connect this to large where you can just say, like, you have to quench the star formation, not grow it anymore, or where you form some more stars and then, you know, di di you know distribute it uh, um, after, after forming them. I think that's an open question. Yeah. Okay, I think that concludes our morning session. Let's thank all our speakers in the morning.